Greetings and salutations. Happy Tuesday as I'm recording this. Sorry I didn't get up and running yesterday, but technical issues bedeviled me. Uh, thankfully, back today. Hopefully everything will go go uh, as planned. My streaming interface has, uh, has had some bugginess to it lately. We'll see if that holds true. Hopefully not. Hey, Ian. Ian says, very excited to get this book. Yeah, I think a lot of people were. I know that uh, after having talked with Chris, I was able to get a hold of an early copy from Free League, but I kind of put it aside and I was waiting for the uh, the announcement, which I think I got in my inbox today that it's live so I could share links to it and folks can actually get it. And I'm not just talking about something that only a select few can receive. Uh, <laughs> says, Let's get on. Let's get into it. Yeah, that's it. I don't have any other notes. Let's uh, let's get into it. Let me switch to get in the page display. Oh, that's fine. Uh, full screen mode. There we go. Into the odd rules and writing by Chris McDowell. This edition has that really wonderful, uh, uh, evocative art by Johan Noor. Let's see what we get. Uh, <clears throat> I might try to be judicious. There's a lot here. We'll see. I might have to break this up in parts. I'm probably not going to read everything. I, you know, I'm definitely going to skip the new to RPGs kind of thing. And maybe we'll go over uh, rolling, uh, rolling character at least some, some parts thereof. Playing the game, definitely. I think Arcana will be good. Chapter, um, chapter five and the example of play is always something that's interesting to read. Folks who have been into it already, if there's something, because again, like usual, I have not read this i'm i'm going in there looking at it fresh so if you have something that you know is absolutely amazing and key to understand the system or a key selling point or something that the system brings to the table that other systems maybe not let me know and we'll, i'll try to make sure to hit it if not say that maybe tomorrow on oh, it is nice to know that it is <clears throat> the, the uh, pdf which is from my copies from drive through it is uh it's got hyperlinks in the pdf which is I will read the intro because I think it's good to kind of set the scene as to uh, <clears throat> what kind of game this is. I'm losing my voice. It appears there's a swig of uh, tea for the working man. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Brian Smith wants to know what, uh, what a trick is in Chapter 10. And uh, says that Chapter 8 might have some DM type stuff or stuff, as Brian Smith says. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I'm sure it has. I'm sure there's some around. I definitely want to get to that. Uh, it'll be, we'll, uh, we'll see how many days or how many episodes it takes to get there. But for now, we'll begin with an introduction, an odd world. The world is too large for explorers to map and too old for academics to record. Expeditions return with tales of places bizarre, wondrous, and horrific. You are an explorer, braving the unknown in search of riches, knowledge, and power. Most of all, you seek arcana, strange devices holding unnatural powers. They range from a humble piece of jewelry to vast sculptures. There are many religious and scientific theories around their existence, but most settle somewhere in between. Hold on a second, I'm just gonna <clears throat> one of the mute there to try to get some of whatever's in my throat out. Citizens, citizens flock to Bastion. Its vast industries provide dangerous but dependable work, and its docks send guns, chemicals, and newspapers to distant neighbors. Beneath the city, the underground stretches just as far. Sewers twist into tunnels, hiding ancient caves and forgotten vaults. Fallen cities are adorned with statues of star beings. Cultists manifest their fervor into reality, and belligerent unions prepare for a cosmic invasion. Familiar landscapes are overrun by strange weeds, corrosive mists creep in from the sea, and jet black mountains watch from the horizon. This odd world has been affected by being stranger than we can imagine. Throwing off, we get a good sense of what this world is like and who we are, what we're doing in it. We're exploring, we're trying to brave the unknown in search of riches. We have the one main city of bastion and then everything kind of moves out from there we are looking for arcana those seem to be kind of our ultimate goals the things we would love to find most of all out there in the world which seem to be some kind of magic devices they can could be jewels could be a sculpture nobody really knows what they are and then what kind of stuff might be find outside bastion in the wilderness fallen cities cultists trying to do weird rituals, belligerent uh, unions, preparing for some kind of cosmic evasion. And then even familiar landscapes are going to have all kinds of strangeness going on in there. So good stuff. All right, I'm skipping new RPGs. Oh, that was that was fast. 
uh, rolling a character. I'm just going to go over this briefly. Into the Odd has three attributes that we're dealing with. The Strength, which is for for fighting, fortitude, and toughness. Dexterity, which is for grace, athletics, and reflexes. And then Willpower, which is for confidence, discipline, and charisma. And then their version of Hit Points, they call it, at least they're using HP, it's called Hit Protection. We start with D6. And then we get uh, starter packages we can get, and then we can have companions, potentially. And now we have a whole table full of starter packages. I'm not going to read all of these, but let's just take... Let's just take... Uh, let's take one. So what are we rolling on here? Match your highest ability score against your hit protection to find your starter package. Weapons have their damage rule listed. Those marked with a B are bulky. More information, more information can be found in the equipment list. Arcana are rolled randomly on a further page. If two characters have the same equipment, the second character takes their starting package from the column to the left or right if this is not possible. Or from the left or the right if it's not possible. Okay. Uh, Perkins says, uh, we haven't gotten into the ad yet, but it would be fun to get a group of friends to play. I agree. I mean, I'd love to have a group of friends that will play everything. Everything and anything. I'd love to have, like, a one-shot. Listen, though, I can never get enough going on with the channel where I can afford to do things like take time. <laughs> take time to do things particularly, especially for the stream. I would love to do, like, hey, get a one-shot gang together and every... Every couple of weeks or every week or some schedule come out with a live one shot of us taking one of these systems, any system, anything, and running a kind of a one shot with it. Would love to do it. Got to get the got to get to that ability first. And I'm not not there yet, but it's a it's a it's a dream I have. So you take your highest ability. Well, it doesn't matter which one. And then you look at the amount of HP you rolled. And then from there, you're picking your starter package. So let's just say, oh, we got a 12 and a 4. So we come over here. And we've got a p pistol that does D6 damage, a rocket, which I guess is not a weapon, but maybe it's some other kind of rocket. And then is that an ability that's toxin immune? Does that mean we, 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 we're poison proof? Not sure. Or is the rocket? No, the rocket wouldn't be toxic toxin immune, would it? We go to five hit points. It says harpoon gun that does D8 and is bulky. A baton that does D6. Some acid in a jar. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's, hopefully the acid isn't just loose in our hand. I Yeah, that would be funny. And then I guess we're slightly ma ma uh, magnetic. And then if we go back and, oh, we only had three hit points, we would have a pickaxe that does D6 damage, a pair of manacles, and an arcanum. And actually, one, two, and three hit points all get Arcanum. Four and five get those, I'm guessing, kind of abilities, or I'm not sure, just bits about our character, the Toxin, Immune, or the Slightly Medic. And then if we had six HP, we don't get any either of those. We just get chain. We get a maul, a dagger, and some chain. I don't know if that's, I'm guessing it's not chain mail, but literally a chain. So a lot of interesting things. I wonder if they uh, they kind of skew the better equipment actually on the on the slower HP people, which would be kind of fun. That if you ended up with lower HP, you actually have stronger equipment. It's kind of nice balancing in point. Oh, I got one eight hit point, but I've got, you know, I got a whole bunch of good stuff. So either either A, this stuff's going to let me live longer, or when I take that one hit point damage and I die, then, hey, everyone can come get some really good equipment off my body. <laughs> it says, a pocket full of loose salad. We've all been there. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Oh, and oh, gosh, it's already gone. All right, hold on. Let me see what's going on with my video. I just noticed it went out. Thankfully, at least the audio doesn't go out. All right, let's. This is my problem. This is the thing. So it's gonna do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna switch back here, and there I am. I don't know why it's doing this. I don't know why. I don't know why it's doing this, but it is. So apologies for that, really quick. All right, so we get back to the equipment list. Yes, the equipment list. I'm not gonna go through all of these. We do have hirelings on the equipment list. Lighter boys, which I guess are their version of torch bearers or link boys, and then we have a mercenaries or an expert. I do like that these things are very breezy. I mean, I guess what's the word I'm thinking? Breezy or just it's quick, quick going. I mean, I'm sure we're gonna get into chapters that are much longer, but I do like that it's hey, making your character super fast, super easy. You you roll, you're gonna roll some dice and then just Instead, you know what? I'll say this: What I like about this system, this uh, starter package table, is it's not even more dice. 
It's not roll, roll, roll. Okay, now roll again. It's roll, roll, roll. What's your highest attribute? How many hit points did you roll? And then, then you already have that. It's kind of nice. So it sort of takes, it probably doesn't mean much in terms of time, but I kind of like how they look at like, hey, let's take the stuff you already rolled and leverage that as opposed to having you roll again. And I just, okay, we went through equipment. We got playing the game. So I am going to read through some of these things because I guess it's important to see what our terms are going to be. So a save is rolled to avoid danger from risky action or situation. Okay, that makes sense. A turn, general, generally players take their turn before the, any enemies. If there is a risk of being surprised, the character, characters must, must each roll a deck save or be unable to act on the first turn. On their turn, players can act in any order they wish. Okay, great. And then actions on their turn, a character can move and perform an action. Attacks are detailed next page. And for other risky actions, the referee calls for the character to risk at risk to roll a save. For example, attending to trip an opponent might force them to pass a strength save to say stay on their feet. So this is definitely combat focused, these terms anyway. Maybe, maybe there'll be more on the next page. I'm going to serve, but we have saves. Okay, if you've played D&D, you kind of understand what a save is. I think when we can see from actions is that we are levering saves, not just for the thing being done to you, but also for, in a sense, things you may be doing to yourself. In other words, you're putting your a save against a fireball, right? Is you're at risk of being burned by the fireball by someone else. And so you roll a save. But then at the same time, as per their example, you're trying to trip somebody, you've kind of put yourself at risk and you have a chance to kind of save to catch yourself. Or at least that seems to be one thing you can use them for. And then of course, turns. And then what surprise means. I find uh, in, you know, D&D, &D, that's one of those, or I should say modern D&D, &D, I guess, you know, what, or maybe because they're actually, I put this, Surprise is always interesting because with all the different versions of D&D, &D, there's so many different ideas of what surprise means that people always munge them all together. Uh, you know, like, oh, the surprise condition versus the surprise round versus this or versus that, right? So it's always funny. It always seems like you have to really emphasize in something what surprise means, even though it doesn't happen maybe all that much, or it might, I guess, depending. But there's always confusion because there's so many different versions of surprise. I think this one's pretty easy. If you're surprised, it's kind of, I would say it's, uh, the players are getting a little bit of a buff here in that regard because it's not one roll. Each character is going to roll. It's not that roll against the world where, oh, one to two, you're all surprised. In this case, you're going to get an extra bit to be surprised or, and each person gets a chance. So it's going to be uh, the, the chances that a whole party of, say, four or five players are all going to be surprised. Probably not going to happen. There's probably it's, it's I guess you're kind of mitigating that surprise factor somewhat. Because I'm guessing if you have four to five players in the party, one of them's gonna have pretty good decks, so one of them's probably gonna have a pretty good shot of saving. So probably you're not gonna get everybody at once. That may be good or maybe bad, depending on how you feel. So what are we doing for attacks? An attacker rolls a die dictated by their weapon and subtracts the opponent's armor score. Their attack causes this much damage. Ranged weapons cannot be used in melee. So you're not rolling to attack, which I think is a big thing for another into the odd generally. You are just rolling for damage. Basically, and the better armor you have, the, the odds are the lower damage you're going to have, usually. Attacks that are impaired, such as firing through cover or fighting while grappled, roll a d4 damage regardless of weapons. Similarly, attacks that are enhanced by a risky stunt or a helpless or vulnerable target roll a d12 damage. So the, I guess the interesting thing here is you're not... Uh, they, they've, uh, I guess, simplified it, what in other systems you might do with die sizes. So in some systems, you might say, okay, you're starting off with D6 damage. If you get enhanced, you would go up to D8. If you got enhanced for fewer D8 damage, you would go up to D10, and then from D10 to D12. Similarly, a D8 would drop down to a D6 or drop down to a D4 in, in uh, negative circumstances. In this case, they're kind of just, they're flattening that out. They're saying, look, if you, are, if you are impaired, it's just a D4. It's not one weapon size down. And then if you're enhanced, though, you go as many weapon sizes up to you hit D12, and that's where you sit, as opposed to, Going and say if you had a D4 weapon, going to D6, D8. <clears throat> of course, you could, if you wanted to have that kind of extra granularity, you could. It's an interesting kind of choice. It's just saying, yeah, we're going to wipe all that out and just say, yeah, D4 and D12 and not worry about, say, variable, variable changes to uh, attack damages. Blast weapons cause damage to all targets in an appropriate area, rolling separately for each. If in doubt how, as to how many targets are affected, roll the weapons damage die. That's a nice thing, too. I've said this before when you're, I think, you know, they're saying this out, essentially, they're pretty much putting that out for theater of the mind stuff, which is one of the questions that comes up often in theater of the mind. I think way back at the beginning of the 
pandemic, I took a walk in the park and I filmed a little video on that where you just kind of, you just sort of rough it. There are 12 ruffians in the alley with you and, and the, the, uh, the wizard goes fireball. And you're wondering, well, how many ruffians did you get? Now there's probably more. And given the context, they, well, there's, you're not going to get all of them, but how many do you get? And of course we're, we're playing theater of the mind. So there's no grid. There's no counting out squares. There's no taking down your little tool for your radius radi to make the radi radius of the fireball. So you go up. How do I figure it out? And you just roll some dice. And I kind of appreciate that here, since I'm guessing this game is sort of built more or less to play theater of the mind as their default. That's their default assumption that they're just giving you the rule straight out. Hey, if you're in doubt, if you're not sure, because you're playing theater of the mind, you don't have everybody out on a grid, then just roll the die. And that tells you. And it's nice too, because it kind of, it kind of gives an advantage to the bigger weapons, which makes sense. If you have a small weapon that's D4, but does, has radial damage, then if, if, if it isn't obvious how many, it's only going to get four people max, whether, you, whether when you have a D8 blast weapon, then obviously you can, on a good roll, you'll, you'll double the amount of potential enemies or victims, targets. Damage. When an individual takes damage, they lose that many hit protection. If they have no hit protection left, they are wounded, and any remaining damage is removed from their strength score. They must then pass a strength save to avoid critical damage. So what happens, you have so much hit protection, you run out of hit protection, the damage starts going straight to your strength. Um, and once that happens, you have to pass a strength save to avoid critical damage. And what is critical damage? A character that takes critical damage is unable to take further action until they are intended to by an ally and have a short rest. If they are left for an hour without being tended to, they die. Ooh, so that's interesting. So critical damage, it's not more damage. It's basically a state. You are in a critically damaged state. You are critically wounded. You are, I guess in the case to say mortally, I would just, you know, mortally wounded probably is the best term, I think, because unless you are tended to, if you're mortally wounded or you're, you're bleeding out, then you either got to be tended to, or if you're not within an hour, they die. And then finally, using an arcana, my character can use an arcana's power as a normal action, though some arcana ask for something in return. Okay, that's interesting. And as far as actions, remember, you get a move and an action. So it's very simple combat action economy. Ability score loss. If a character has their strength score reduced to zero, they are dead. If the decks or will are reduced to zero, the character is <clears throat> par paralyzed or mentally broken, respectively, and cannot act until they have a full rest. So remember, you can keep taking, looking at the damage here, you can lose all your hit protection. You can keep, you can start taking hits to your dam your strength, but you'll get these strength saves. You might not take critical damage. But in any case, if you were lucky enough to get down to zero strength without being in the critical damage state, or I, I suppose even if you were taking critical damage, you were in that critically damaged state, they could still thwack you. Then you die. When a character dies, the player creates a new character. All right, I don't need to go with that. Somebody deprived of a crucial need cannot, <clears throat> cannot benefit from rests. I like that rule. Reaction. Another swig of tea here. I don't know what's going on. <clears throat> we're in a weird, we're in a weird place in New York right now. If you didn't know, I'm in New York. That's where the global Hexpress headquarters currently resides. And one, it's gotten really cold. Not really cold, but it's been cold. And two, it's in that spot where we've, we, New York is humid in the summer, but it's not humid all year round. And it's kind of going from humid to dry. Maybe it's even fluctuating a little bit. I feel like it's doing weird things with my throat. So apologies in advance if my I've got to hack up, hack up my lungs as I'm speaking here. Hopefully it will pass as fall slides into winter and the and the weather settles. Reaction when the group encounters another being, the characters the character initiating contact must pass a will save to avoid an unfavorable first reaction. Hold on a minute. When the group encounters another being, the character initiating contact must pass a will save to avoid an unfavorable first reaction. Some encounters are always hostile or always friendly, but all have potential to change after first contact. So interesting, they've taken reaction rolls and turned it into a save. If you fail, it's unfavorable. I don't know if I love that. I guess we have to see how they use it. Maybe we'll see in the example of play. The reason why I don't love it is one, it kind of puts it's a situation where it puts somebody kind of in charge. I suppose this could happen anyway, where you want your most charismatic person up front. Uh, and maybe this does the same thing. I feel like this does it even more 
but I don't know. Maybe it depends on how the will saves. I don't know. We don't. I don't think we have a sense of what the um how the how those ramp up because a you know your charisma bonus is basically flat. Oh, I got plus one. Yeah, plus one all together. And maybe saves in the D and D game. You know they they escalate. They scale as you go up. So depending on your class, even though someone might have a charisma bonus better than someone else at level four, maybe the other person has better save. Um, so we'll see how that balances out. I guess maybe the thing is that it is is interesting is it does make it player facing. Hey, roll that save, or I guess the GM rolls it for you. Uh, whereas your other reaction rolls are generally just kind of again, it's the world kind of rolling with maybe a modifier depending on what you're in. In first contact, presumably you don't have any rep, you have no reputation or anything, so you're just assuming there's no particularly hostile. Uh, Hostile context. You didn't just, you know, you don't emerge out of, out of the, uh, into the into one room where a creature is with the blood of all their forefathers on your blades. So it's just kind of plain. It's just kind of the world versus you just rolling to see kind of how they feel about you. Whereas this one is based on a a player statistic, which means that as you get higher levels, I guess you 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 would you would just everyone would like you more. I don't know. I mean, I kind of like playing with that idea that oh, you're high levels so you're kind of more heroic but it doesn't always work i don't know i'm not sure i'm not sure how i feel about it but i appreciate that it's there right smith says they have to rip up all the sleeves off their flannels if they live further south well i don't know how how far south do you how far north do you live right smith are you in the in the mountains and the tundra so that was reaction morale groups are requiring a will save to avoid being routed when they lose half their total numbers groups with a leader may use the leader's will score in place of their own lone combatants must pass the save when they are reduced to zero hit protection this applies to opponents and allies but not player characters fleeing to safety under pursuit requires a deck save and somewhere to withdraw to. i'm fine with this one because morale in terms of the combat it makes sense and this is nice because you don't have to track that of the morale value and like in you know basic Basic expert, or in I think even AD and D also, you'd have these morale scores. I think in AD and D had it too. Your know, morale scores, and you'd have to look up the monster, look up the morale score. It's already kind of built into your will, so that's nice. You already have uh, presumably the will score next to the monster, or you just you roll it up. So then you just you don't have to keep track of another attribute. I guess is what I'm saying. Um, though they the thing is, I will say the the flip side of that it was it was it's kind of nice depending on how much stuff. Remember, we only have three attributes, so will is used for a lot. And part of morale, you could have somebody who's not, they don't have much willpower, but they're steady or they're loyal or something else. And you could reflect that with the morale score. Yeah, these guys may not be charismatic, particularly wise or anything, but <clears throat> boy, are they loyal. <clears throat> Man, where's my voice going? Another swig. Boy, are they loyal. They're the, the pig-faced guys in Jabba the Hutt's palace. Though they're kind of cowardly, I think they tended to kind of run away. But anyway, we'll just say, yeah, they're loyal. Pig faced, not very bright, ugly, but they're loyal. Great. I suppose you could do this with do this with a modifier to that will set will saves. You can make a note saying, hey, they roll plus whatever to their will saves for morale. But then at that point, if I have to do that a lot, then just having a morale score just makes more sense. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that we intend to do a lot, or if we're just going to go with that just sort of well we're just abstracting them all together and we'll just uh we'll deal with the fact that there might be some edge cases where it might not be quite right short rest is a few minutes of rest and a swig of water that recovers all of a character's lost hit protection resting may waste time or attract danger hint 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 full rest requires a week of downtime downtime and that restores all ability scores that's fine I tend to want to get more granular with how much you how much you restore in a, a day I suppose you could do that you could make something up. The reason why I might like it more granular, or at least I like it maybe more granular myself, is because depending on what kind of ticking clocks and fronts and things like that you have going on, what's happening in your game, maybe the party wants to spend a little bit less than a week. And this kind of makes it an all or nothing thing, um, which again, might be fine, might be not be. It kind of depends on if you're going to have a, you know, I'm thinking about it, right? We've got, I've said this, hey, you're dungeon delving, it's 10 minutes to do things, regardless of if it's a little bit more, a little bit less saying 10 minutes it's it's x amount of minutes for a combat round regardless of if people end up standing still or running and doing stuff whatever however much they fill that time's about the same maybe we just say hey a downtime turn is one week and so we're gonna say whatever you're doing it's a week in which case that kind of fits otherwise 
I might like the granularity because players might want to do different things. Oh my gosh, we can't spend a week because the bad guy's about to do something, but we could spend three days. Does three days get us anything? That kind of thing. A Gasherin on Ryan Smith's Oh in Michigan. In Michigan. Bulky. Items marked as bulky general require two hands or significant stores to carry. Bulky weapons require two hands to wield. Anybody carrying three or more bulky items is reduced to zero hit protection. I do like that idea that this hit protection is exactly what it says. It, it's your avoidance of getting hit. While you have that, you have not actually gotten hit yet. Once you have gone through that, you're kind of open to attack. And if you're carrying something bulky, carrying a bunch of bulky stuff, you just don't have the wherewithal to get out of the way and avoid things. Hence, zero hit protection. It's a nice fit. Arcana, these are powers you cannot understand. Arcana are the most highly sought after items in the world. Characters that are open about the Arcana they carry are targeted by collectors and charlatans. If a character's starting package contains an Arcanum, you roll D66 to see which one they get. I'm not going to read all these, but I'll read, I'll read a couple of these that are on this page, but we know there's a bunch. I'm not sure what, 11 to 66 was at 55 different ones here something like that gatekeeper's sigil create a gate between two flat surfaces that you can see the gates close if you pass through or break line of sight that's neat but it's but, but it's that you can see so you can't get super far with it unless of, of course you had some other item maybe that could give you far sight or a, a spyglass or something but still you can bounce around areas a bit pierced heart State an object you desire. The heart indicates its direction and vague distance. That's good. I would kind of say that you need to have know the name. That's kind of a neat one if you had that kind of true name sort of idea where you you, you have to, yeah, you can, the object, sure, you can find it, but you got to know, yeah, know exactly what it is or what it's called. Pale flame, an object you touch glows with white light. Contact with the glowing object causes a chilling pain. The effect wears off when the arcanum is used again. So you can kind of make yourself a little light and uh, cause a little bit of pain. They don't give a number on the pain, so maybe it's not enough to actually affect your hit, take out hit protection, but that'll be a nice one. I wouldn't mind at all if they said, if you uh, touch the glowing object, you lose one hit protection, but it won't, it won't ever take away attribute damage. In other words, you can't, you can't drain somebody's strength with it, but you can whack down their hit protection. Soul chain, target must pass a dex save to avoid your touch or they lose D6 will and you get a glimpse of their current desire. And then let's see, gavel of the unbreakable seal. One door, one window is sealed until you open it. Or foul sensor, green smoke surrounds you and everyone within 20 feet. Missiles cannot pass through the smoke. Those are cool. And there's a bunch more, which I'm not going to read through, but there are those. So those are just, uh, I guess, regular arcana. Now we have another list. So wait, if regular arcana were powers you cannot understand, but I guess you can control them, though you don't understand how they work, then greater arcana are powers you can barely control. So you, not only can you not understand these, well, you can barely control them. These arcana are more likely to be actively sought out by others. Those that are undiscovered are likely to be hidden in very deep and dangerous places or behind powerful guards. Again, I will read just a couple of these. Hypno Torch. Target repeats their current action until you say stop or they pass the save on their turn. Inferno Device. Cause a source of fire to explode causing D10, D10 damage to all within 20 feet. And then Power Leech. Target must pass a will save or else you swap strength scores with them. Either side returns their strength score to its original value when they rest. Oh, so that lasts a while. Or at least until one side rests. So presumably if you snatch the strength of an ogre and the ogre decides to go take a nap right away, then you might lose it at the end, at the end of their rest. Still, pretty neat. Perkins says, uh, these are definitely story elements less about game mechanics. Yes. Yes, indeed. I mean, the Inferno device is definitely a, has a mechanic. I think it's, you know, it's going to depend. I think they're a mix and match, right, of game elements. I just think if you're going to say it gives them a pain, here's the reason why I, I say like about the, like if we go back to the other one where it says, hey, it causes a chilling pain. Because knowing that, or at least my, having seen a number of tables when this comes up, it causes a pain. I just know someone's going to want to do something was going to want to weaponize it in some way at some point with good reason you're in a uh you know you're uh you go to see uh a, a, a lord you know a knight in the castle and he's you're not sure if they, they maybe they're not maybe they're not nice or we discover they're not nice but before we discover that they've taken our weapons away 
And now we're in a situation where maybe we have kind of improvised weapons or something. <clears throat> and I remember that, oh, what they didn't take off, what they didn't recognize was my little, my little uh, necklace that I'm wearing, which is actually that arcanum of the glowing light. So I take a table leg and I break it off and I, uh, I, I, I use the arcanum to make the end glow, one acting as a torch as maybe we're trying to escape from the castle. <clears throat> and maybe I need to thwack something, a guard, I don't know, a, a, an, an accidental, a butler that accidentally sees us, something, maybe even the, 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 the knight himself or themselves. And, and that, that idea that this thing has damage attached to it becomes something that I might be really counting on. I'm looking at my sheet going, oh, yes, yeah, this does damage. This is, it gives them pain. So then, you know, as a GM, I can either say, well, it didn't say anything, so I guess nothing, or, well, it did, you know, whatever. And yeah, sure, I can say, okay, it does D4, like I said just now. Okay, it does one, whatever. But I think as a GM, like, I can see that that's something that a player might want to know. It's kind of an obvious question. Oh, this does pain, gives you pain how much? So just for me, it's just easier just to say, I can see what's going to happen once it makes pain. So knowing that, let me just give you a number. Or just give you a mechanic to go with it. You can obviously, as the GM, you can overwrite anything you want. But here's what we want, what we're thinking about. Or here's our our idea, because we know what's going to come up as soon as I say pain. It causes pain. Someone's going to ask, "Ooh, how much pain?" Jacob Mark says they're running into the out right now, and the pale flame has worked well for scaring away wimpy enemies. I, I, I can imagine that's a good. That'll be another cool thing. I like that you allowed that, Jacob, or whoever is. Uh, if that's you, that's running it. I guess he's running it. So. Um, you know, to, yeah, to give that as effect. Yeah, some kind of ghostly, eerie, cold flame that pains you the first time somebody pings you with it. Yeah, I'd want to stay away from that too. Brian Smith said, or if it says slight pain or say anything, yeah, it's just nice, you know, give me, a, give me a number, give me something, give me your idea of what it could be. I can always change it myself if I think it's too much, too little, little. but, you know, if it didn't say it, if it just said something like, uh, I don't know, and, and that's, I guess, that's probably what I would say. Well, if it just makes you uncomfortable, then just say that. Like, yeah, it doesn't actually do damage, but it, it does make you uncomfortable. Whatever. I mean, it's not, it's, look, it's not a big deal or anything. I just, I just appreciate when some of those things where you know you're kind of throwing something out there that, you, you know, as soon as, like I said, as soon as I say pain, I feel like someone's going to ask how much. So just answer the question you know is coming, basically. But, you know, it's not, it's a nothing not like uh, I suddenly hate the book. I hate it. No, no, of course not. It's fabulous so far. I just sometimes wish for that little bit of extra specificity when it's obvious that we're going to need it. We might need it. No, leather, legendary arcana, powers you shouldn't control. These arcana are likely to be known relics. They tend to be large objects like, like altars or thrones. Those that are unclaimed remain so for a reason. Only the most powerful individuals would openly admit to possessing a legendary arcanum as they are desired by anybody who craves power. Again, I will just read a few of these to get an idea. Weather altar causes the weather within a mile radius to change for the rest of the day. In the case of dangerous weather, you cannot target specific individuals or locations or cause extremes that are inescapably lethal. But you could do that if it wasn't dangerous weather. I wonder why they say in the case of dangerous weather. So if the weather was nice, if I was changing it to sunny days, is that saying I could target specific individuals or locations, but I can't if it's nasty? I would just probably just take that out. Just take out that first bit. Hey, you can't target specific individual locations or cause lethals. Oh, Jacob Marks says that uh, in their game, the uh, pale flame got weaponized against the players by a telekinetic enemy. Had, they had the enemy make the players' weapons too painful to hold. See, that's a good one. I like that. That's where I think, and maybe that's maybe that's the thing, Jacob Marks. I really like your approach with it. I think maybe they had that little text in one of the other ones that, hey, it may, like, this pain may cause you to drop or do something else. Like, that might be a nice little hint in there. If you mean the pain from that to not inflict damage, but may have some other negative result, maybe just give that hint. Because they've done that, and there's early in the book, there's a couple of those where they say, oh, it might, you know, like, yeah, resting here might be a bad idea, you know, that kind of thing. But I, I really like that. That's a very clever, clever counterattack on folks getting too, too, uh, maybe uh, too comfortable with their, with their pale flame. So that was the weather altar. Obliteration prism. Choose a target and roll a d12. If this is equal to or higher than their current hit protection, they are completely destroyed in a blast of fire. <laughs> oh boy 
Our word kill. Yep. Rebirth coffin. Corpse is miraculously restored to life if they pass a will save. If they fail to save, the remains are utterly destroyed. Oh, what a shame. Though, you know, I almost like better if something, if it turned into something nasty. I suppose the thing is you only get one shot at it, but I kind of would appreciate if something like, uh, what might, what might some horrible thing, you know, what might be fun with this rebirth coffin is you put the corpse in it. They roll their will save. If they fail to save, the remains vanish, but somewhere else in the world, somewhere like a revenant or some kind of serious, however powerful death knight, something really strong lich or something, some creature is then created. It doesn't happen right there. So it's not that you can put it in the coffin and then, you know, be ready there to attack if the thing goes bad. But you know that if it fails, something things gone bad and now it's somewhere else. And what happens with that? Maybe the thing has some kind of will to destroy you. Uh, who knows? Who knows where it would be? Maybe it shows up somewhere in that in that individual's past, like where they were born or where they spent some time. Or it could happen in a bunch of places. That might be more fun and add a little even extra oomph to whether you should really use it or not. Space Cube. You and up to one companion are teleported to a location you have been to before. I hope it's a location you choose. <laughs> That has like a genie like ring to it. I can teleport you to a location you have been to before. Do it. Teleport us to the so and so. And then the, the genie goes, All right, I'm going to. I didn't say I'd teleport you to one you wanted to go to before. I decided to teleport you to a place you've been before. And then, yeah, you know, something happens. All right. So we get the idea. Ooh, the malice gong. All enemies within 20 feet lose D6 strength. That's a nasty one, too, especially if you've been wounded a bunch. Perkins says it'd be funny if they were reborn as a baby. <laughs> Yeah, maybe that'll be another one. They get that would be an interesting one too, right? If they fail to save, maybe they're born like some like D66, because that's a, a fun one for this year years older or younger. So maybe older if they roll odd, younger if they roll even. And if they roll beneath their age, then yeah, they just vanish. Or if they roll above some age, you make some make an, a further save or or they crumble into you know dust. So those are some examples of legendary arcana. Now we got, here we go. This should be good. Example of play. I almost feel like whether I should read these first, but I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate that it just exists. Far too often, we don't have these anymore. It was something that all the old versions of the game, I think White Box, I think had an example. Maybe not. Uh, Holmes definitely did. Uh, BX definitely did. I'm not sure if it, I think fifth edition, I think has, I don't I don't know if it fell out of, at some point after AD&D or ad &D later, but I really like these examples of play. They can highlight much. So let's see what this one has to has for us. This is three player characters and their hireling lighter boy are deep in the underground. So the referee says, you are faced with a set of tall wooden doors, 10 feet high and pretty sturdy. There's no sign of any traps, but you can see that the door is barred from the other side. Toku says, great. So something is alive in there. Ezekiel says, this could have been done centuries ago. What condition is the door in? The referee says, looks rotten in places. It's pretty old. Uthred says, well, we didn't come this far to be beaten by a door. How about I hack through it? The referee says, well, you'll make a lot of noise, but your axe should be able to get through it. Right, I chop away. The referee makes a luck roll, rolling a four. This is high enough that nothing is alerted by the noise. I don't think we've covered luck mechanics yet, so we might have to see that later. You bust open the doors, which reveals a spectacular room, 30 feet high and equally wide. Its walls are an intricate mosaic, but the tiles are constantly shifting color. Wave patterns wash across the walls, and in the center of the floor is a six-foot-wide shaft. Ezekiel who's, Ezekiel, who's sketching down the room in his rough map. So, it's a dead end. The walls might be worth investigating. I'm being very careful not to touch them and tell my lighter boy to do the same. I don't know what part of there's a shaft in the floor that they say is a dead end, but I suppose maybe in the, I suppose they're only talking about horizontally speaking. Toku says, oh, come on. We hired him because he's disposable. Maybe Uthred should try touching them. Uthred says, I'm not scared of a wall, but I'm not stupid. I'll try tapping the wall with the handle of my axe. The referee says, the pattern of the tiles doesn't seem to respond, but as you're inspecting them more closely, you can feel that they're giving off a slight heat. Uthred says, enough to burn me? The referee replies, doesn't look like it, only a slight heat. 
Uther Red says, I place my hand boldly against the tiles. The other players groan in unison. As soon as Uthred's hand touches the wall, the shifting colors stop. A pulsing blue pattern starts to radiate from around Uthred's hand. Ezekiel says, stand by for his head exploding. Referee says, the tiles are warm, but you don't feel any other effect. No head explosion, thankfully. Uthred says, huh, weird. Well, I'll check out the shaft. Referee says, as soon as you remove your hand from the wall, it starts to shift colors again, and now you see the tiled shape of a person. It's your reflection. Barely a second later, the room is filled with a crackling noise, and the tiled visage, visage of Uthred somehow steps out of the wall, hefting the axe from its back and taking up a combat stance. Doku says, nobody else touched the walls. I'll leap at the copy of Uthred with my daggers. Roll for damage. Well, Toku rolls a d8. That's four. Referee says, okay, you dodge past the tiled being and stab it in the side. Instead of a scream, a copy of Uthred rolls out in crackling static noise. It's still standing. Uthred says, I'll have at it with my axe, trying to drive it away from Ezekiel and the lantern bearer. Referee says, okay, roll for damage. Rolls a d6, scores a five. Uthred does. I have five. Referee, seeing that the target is now at zero hit protection, takes the remaining two damage from its strength. You kick the thing back, knocking it off balance and burying your axe in its side. Shouts out in static fuzz, roll the strength save, succeeding, but continues to fight. There's only room for one Uthred here, Uthred cries. The referee says the copy of Uthred drops its axe on the ground and reaches forward to try to grab Toku. Give me a strength save. Toku rolls her strength save. Uh, I got a 20. Referee over the groans of the table says the creature grabs Toku and slams them against the wall. You see a blue pulsing pattern form on its surface. A moment later, the colors shift into its shape his shape, and a copy of Toku steps forward from the wall. Ezekiel says, I never thought I'd have to choose between killing Toku and Uthred. I'm going to use that annihilation rod we found earlier and try to destroy, to destroy the copy of Toku. The, ref, the copy gets a strength save to resist the attack, but it fails. Ezekiel rolls a d12 for strength loss as, as dictated by the Arcanum. 11! The referee checks his notes to see that this reduces the creature's strength to zero. It's enough to drain the enemy, drain the enemy, drain the energy from this thing. Setting the rod causes the colors to fade from the being as it falls motionless to the ground and snaps out of existence, completely destroyed. Uthred says, yes. The referee says, you should be aware that you've really been making quite a lot of noise in this room. And then secretly makes a luck roll to see if any nearby monsters have noticed the noise. A roll of one indicates something bad should happen. So he rolls on the hostile encounter table he has prepared for this area. Ezekiel says, I don't like the sound of this. All right, so let me uh, let me just pause there for a moment. So we see a couple things. We can see at least how ideally the roll for damage. We're not rolling attacks, we're rolling damage, which it's hard to say how that would be, right? So so what's the what's the what's the advantage? The advantage is that the players are always going to be doing if, if they just go for a regular attack, they don't do anything more than that. It's just a matter of how much damage they're doing. They'll presumably. We haven't really seen what the kind of armor values you can get. There could be times where you just, you roll to, you roll below the damage threshold of the armor or whatever the armor or the damage reduction is. Let's say if you say you're wearing a uh, chain mail and that's, I don't know, damage reduction of two. I'm just throwing that out there. Then you roll a one, you don't do any damage. But more often than not, you're probably gonna do some damage. And that probably feels good as a player. You're constantly doing this stuff. It also means, though, I think the flip side is that I think everyone's going to have a lot more hit points. If you've got a 10 from your strength hit points and you've got four hit protection, then basically you've got 14 hit points at first level, something of that, which is a good deal more than you're going to get in your average, say, BX game, where you're going to have maybe one to six hit points of damage, roughly. On average, what, three or four hit points? Considering you rolled a 10 for your constitution and you rolled a three, three to four, three to point five is the average on a D6. So round it up, say four hit points, four on your hit points. So you're going from four hit points to like 13 or 14 hit points. You're going to, uh, you're going to be able, there's going to be a lot more of that combat, <clears throat> which may be pushing you to, um, to, to do things a little bit different. Hey, I've got I've got this annihilation rod. I need to use it because we can't wait. That, that the the one thing is you have this attrition maybe that's going to come in. Remember you you can get your all your hit protection back from from taking that short rest. 
just taking a, a quick break, swig of water, bam, you get your hip protection back. But your strength and stuff takes a week to drain or it's a week to get back. So while you're going to have maybe more immediacy because sure, you're going to get your hip protection back, which might be equivalent to your hip points, right? You might have as much hip protection as someone has hip points, but someone's going to get all their hip points back after a rest while your strength is going to keep going down and it's harder to kill enemies. Maybe it all works out in the wash in terms of the cadence of combat and what it means, but it's going to work a little bit differently. But in the moments, lots of times you're going around doing stuff and it's going to feel, maybe feel better. You're not going to have, you're not going to get caught with as many, I don't think, swing and a miss, swing and a miss, swing and a miss. While also, because it's going to be more, in a sense, slower, if that's all you're doing, that you want to get over it and maybe the bad guys, the monsters are going to have more kind of killer things to do to you maybe pushes you to use items and things at a rate that you might not use in your normal game, especially if you get more of them. I'm not sure on that point. I obviously haven't played it, but that's maybe one of the things that's coming up. Um, it seems to move pretty quickly, but again, this is kind of an idealized example. But less things to roll, less things to keep track of. You just can't keep your weapons die. You don't even have to worry about how your... Um, Whatever your class features, I don't even think if there are any class features, we haven't seen any, so I don't even think there are any class features, right? You just roll your weapon die and you go. So it makes it very easy to keep track of what you're doing. And it also scales differently because you're not getting lots of, people aren't getting easier to do damage to. You're that D8 that you have from your whatever, you might get a better weapon, but you're not getting better at it. It seems like, I, I don't know if we I haven't seen what advancement looks like, so but it doesn't feel like that's a thing. I don't know, what we'll to see. In this case, they certainly weren't asking for Oh, I've got, I'm a level three or I have X skill. It's just D8 damage, D8. So it seems like the way you're going to be getting better at the game is through picking up stuff like Annihilation Rods and Arcana and then utilizing them. Perkins says, fewer dice rolls for combat. I would need to play with it for a while to get a feel for how it works. Yeah. Yeah, I think, like I said, I think it, it definitely shows off a more kind of heroic side because you're, 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 you're more successful. It seems to be you're more successful. So I wonder how the math works. Maybe it ends up being about the same, but it just feels, it's got that feeling of doing more because you're doing getting more hits, even though ultimately if you were to math it out, you might say, oh, it's, this takes three rounds in basic expert and it takes three rounds in into the odd, but maybe it has a different, those three rounds have a different feel than I miss for two rounds and then I hit and killed the thing versus I kind of, I wore it down over the three rounds, right? Maybe. Let's continue. Uh, I'll say Ezekiel. Okay, we got that part. Ezekiel says, I don't like the sound of this. The referee says, you notice the sound of something approaching behind you. Remember that weird horse-like creature with skin like super hard tree bark you were ambushed by last session? Ruthwood says, sure. We knocked it down that pit and fled like heroes. The referee says, well, this thing looks almost identical, but rather than being horse-sized, it's large enough to barely be able to squeeze through the doorway. Its jaws are big enough to be able to swallow you whole, and its four legs end in grasping claws spanning some six feet. Needless to say, it's got you in its sights, and it doesn't seem friendly. Fails a will save for the copy of Uthred as the sight of this thing is enough to scare it. The copy of Uthred, Uthred sees this thing and immediately crawls back into the wall, fading into the tiles. <laughs> That's interesting, too, because you would, I would have thought that maybe they were a construct, the, the, uh, the tile copies, so they, th thus they would not have a fear. But it's an interesting touch by the GM. It almost, <laughs> almost makes you want to see more of like, ooh, what, what is that thing that they feel fear? But in any case, it it um it caused the Uthred thing to even though it's a machine to feel feel uh feel like it wanted to preserve itself and it left. Ezekiel says, I don't much like the idea of being swallowed whole. What are our chances of running through its legs? The referee says it's pretty tightly packed into the doorway. If you want to try, it would require a deck save. I think the interesting thing here is it would probably require a deck save even if it wasn't tightly packed in the doorway, right? I'd be curious, like if it was normal. <clears throat> excuse me if it, it wasn't in there would they just would they would the referee just let them run through it i don't i don't think so uthred says the smaller monster was afraid of fire wasn't it perhaps we should send the lantern bearer over to try to keep it at bay ah uh, yes referee says he looks pretty hesitant a will save would be involved for such a reckless mission you never know though he might go for it toku says running past it and trying to scare it seems needlessly risky when we have a perfectly good exit right here Luther says the shaft. Does it look like the creature could fit down there? Unlikely. It's pretty tight, says the ref. Ezekiel <clears throat> says, <clears throat> man, excuse me. Ezekiel says, as perilous as it sounds, it might be our best hope. 
I try to throw a coin or something into the shaft? As you flick a half shilling down the shaft, you hear a distant splash a few seconds later. Toku says, water. Ezekiel says, that's optimistic. How do we know it isn't acid or something? That's that acid that the one guy, see what happened was somebody in there earlier who at character generation got the pocket full of acid and they dumped it in the shaft. That's how you got here. How do we know it's not acid or something? I figure we can find a way to distract it long enough for us to escape that back up the staircase. Referee says, while you're formulating this plan, the creature has managed to force itself into the room, brushing against the tiled wall, which sends out blue, blue ripples. Luther says, oh crap, this isn't going to end well. Ezekiel says, fine, into the hole. Goku says, trust me, I'll even leap at first. Referee says, you're all leaping down now? The group all nod reluctantly. You the referee says, you plunge into the darkness of the shaft, falling for a few seconds before splashing into what feels like ice-cold water, deep enough for you to fall into safely. The bear's lantern is extinguished, and you're barely able to get your bearings in the pitch black pit where you feel a tingling sensation over your bodies. Will saves all around. Groans fill the table. So there you go. So an interesting example of, of a few a few things there. Interesting critters, the, the effect in the room. It's fun. Uh, we get a sense of how combat works or how the, this idealized kind of version of combat is supposed to work with the just rolling for damage. Makes for fun and, and fast, but there's still, you know, it's not like it's so goofy. There's no tactics or anything. I think there's still a lot that you could think about in terms of what the game is allowing you to do, which is pretty much anything. And it seems, I, I don't have a good sense of how the saves work yet. Is it just rolling under your, I know we said at the beginning, but maybe I forgot. I think it's just rolling under your, your stats, so you're going to tend to have a pretty good chance of doing things. Pretty good chance of saves, though you're going to be making a lot of them. It seems like that's really the main mechanic for doing anything kind of risky. It's going to be make that save. So, on the one hand, because you're rolling 3d6, and a 3d6 average is 10.5, so basically 11, and if you have to roll under, you're going to tend to roll less. You're going to tend to, uh, if you've got you know, your average is about the same as what on the D20. It's also 10.5 or 11. So, and you have at least a 50% chance, probably maybe a little bit better, depending. Well, I mean, better or worse, depending on what your stat is, but in a particular stat. But you have probably, you know, your average to average, you have about a 50% chance of doing this, which is pretty good. Better than your saves, let's say, in, you know, at a first level character where you got to roll, you know, you got to beat a, beat a 17. But you'll be rolling a lot of them. So those failures are gonna are gonna hit regularly. So here we go. Here we're getting into experience and stuff. So this is after the expedition. Most often, the goal of an expedition is to find valuable treasure or powerful arcana in a mysterious environment. A successful expedition is simply one that returns to safety with something to show for it. This could be a lost artifact, a terrible secret, or just a good story. Experience levels. When a character has completed the listed requirements, they move on to the next, next experience level. Each time they advance a level, they gain D6 hit protection and roll D20 for each of their ability scores. If the roll is higher, then the score is increased by one. All right, so you, you are going to be able to get better, which is good. And let's see, you will get some more hit protection, which is also excellent. And you don't really have to do much. You just basically have to go in somewhere and come out. And it doesn't seem like there's any, I suppose as a GM, you might want to set some ground rules to not have such goofy things. Like we run in the first, first, first room of the dungeon, then we run out again, right? You probably want to figure out what, what going in and coming back means because just a good story. Do you do you enforce that? If you say to the party at the end of it, hey, if you can tell me a good story about this, then you'll get experience or what? Not sure, but definitely makes for a quick and easy and some of that I think everybody's going to be able to. The nice thing about this is unlike a milestone, this is still, though it's not mechanical and, and mathematical like experience points are, it's something that Everybody can basically understand and agree with. If you find an artifact, you come up with some information or a good story. And the good story one's the one that's the most, eh, okay, but at least you, 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 you could say, hey, tell me a story. And if we all agree that's a good story, and I mean all of us, including me as the GM, then I'll give it to you. Otherwise not. But it, you still, you have a pretty good chance as a player of understanding where you stand in terms of what you need to do to get a level. And you can kind of, you can try to aim for it yourself as opposed to trying to figure out what the GM wants. Reputation. As they advance through experience levels, characters may be treated differently by people they encounter. Okay. And then we experience levels. You have a novice is your new character. Professional means you you've, you've survived one expedition. 
Expert is three expeditions. Since you've, so after you do the professional, now you have to do three more. Veteran, you have to do five after you reach expert level and you have to have an apprentice. Master, you have to have an apprentice that's of expert level and have survived a dangerous expedition with them since reading, reaching veteran level. So you have to, the nice thing is too, I think also is that, hey, you get an apprentice, which I guess is different than a hireling. Maybe they're more like a retainer, but the fact is it uses the same chart. So, hey, when you go off on a, an expedition, you come back and that expedition works for you. It also works for presumably your hirelings who maybe they could level up and out and become apprentices or, become, or just leave or for people you bring with you. So it makes it very easy when you're thinking about when, say, retainers and things or and they call them here, apprentices level up. It's very easy to figure out. You don't have to don't really have to math it. And then beyond is after you've reached master level, then it's kind of like, well, what do you want to do? You, you what, are, what are your ambitions? And then you're kind of just, you're done. But let's see, if we add all these up, no, let's see, you have to have one for professional, four, that's nine. So really it's 10. So really 10 expeditions, if you follow everything, is going to be pretty much You'll, you'll have peaked. And they keep saying, they say dangerous expeditions, which I think means that you can't keep running, can't be, you know, master level and still running through the, you know, level one, you know, novice dungeon. Like you gotta, gotta kind of seek out stuff that's appropriate to your level. Enterprise and war, which I think will be the last one. So it seems like, let me just, I'm just going to go through there. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is enterprise and war will be the last chapter we'll do. It's, 58 minutes so that's probably good and then tomorrow come back and we'll do the gm facing stuff which should be pretty interesting so enterprise and war between expeditions you can try your hand at a business enterprise or muster an organized military force detachments and enterprises cost 10 gold to establish detachments demand a further d6 gold in upkeep each month or else they revolt income new enterprises generate D4 gold of income each month. They also face a threat that causes D, uh, a D4 gold in losses until dealt with. If an enterprise cannot pay its debts, it collapses. It's easy enough. If an enterprise makes profit, its income moves up to the next type of die to a maximum of D12. However, this larger die also applies to losses from threats. And finally, apprentices. At any point, you may decide to take on an apprentice. Take a willing non-player character or roll them up as new and advance them through the experience level as normal under your guide. Battles. Detachments against detachment attacks against individuals are enhanced. Detachments are not harmed by individual attacks unless they are explosive or suitably large for scale. Risky gambits may require a will save from the leader. Casualties. When a detachment takes critical damage, they are broken and cannot act until rallied. At strength zero, the detachment is wiped out. When half of a force is broken, the remaining detachments must pass a will save or be routed. Hit protection ability scores are recovered with short and long rest, just as with individuals. So it's kind of not really stated, but it seems like you run your detachments much like they're just like a person and they just, but they're a group, but you're operating them. It's kind of as one unit. It's kind of like a wargaming rule. Like here's your infantry and this, this group of 10 inch infantry is one detachment. And we're just going to, in game terms, when we're mechanically rolling and doing everything, we're going to, as if they were a person, but it represents this, this figure represents, you know, 10, 10 men, 100 men, whatever. Ian says, hell of a lot better than get some dudes and build a fort at ninth level. Uh, it's definitely a little more. Yeah, I mean, they're they're doing kind of like what Birthright does, though in a, in a, I would say, a much more streamlined and, uh, you know, but also abstracted way, right? Like, yeah, you can start this whenever you want to, basically. You get a bunch of gold. Yeah, invest it, which is cool. We don't know, you know, it, the, it'll remain to be seen if they're giving a lot to play with, or is it just meant to be abstract? Like, I've got 10 guys over here, but they're not really, they're kind of doing stuff, but we're not really, like, going to do, say, like, Birthright and have, like, a map or pushing people around like we're generals. It's kind of more, oh, sort of up in the air kind of thing. But, yeah, it is It is cool. It is, And it seems like a neat way to handle it. Neat as an interesting and also, you know, tidy, clean Improvements. Equipping a detachment costs 20 times the individual item cost. Attachments start with D6 hit points and advanced in experience level, just like individuals do. So you equip a detachment. So I guess you, it's, I suppose it's just linking it to you, which I guess means your detachment comes with you, I suppose. 
Okay, that's interesting. And then they advance in experience levels just as individuals do. And then ships and structures ignore attacks weaker than a cannon and are destroyed at zero hit protection. Recovering hit protection takes day a day of repairs. Yeah, so it's really abstract, right? So they're retreating uh, at detachment like it's a piece of equipment. But I suppose you, you know you can't bring in the dungeon with you, or can you? I don't. I don't know. I would say no. Um, there might be some interesting edge cases with because you know some cases people did bring. I mean, back in the day, would bring a whole bunch of guys, mercs or something, to the dungeon and start doing that thing like in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where it's going to keep throwing people at this problem until somebody looks out and solves the problem, or the gore and viscera from our from our men just clogs up the machinery so we can pass. But it is definitely interesting. And then we have some sample leaders. Urine Spinner of the Black Star Group. Eight strength, 13 hit protection, five gold. Driven to overthrow tyrants, getting rich in the process. They have a revolutionary detachment, seven hit points, armed with muskets. They have an underground distillery that gives them a D4 in gold income. And a smuggling ring that gives them a D6 in income. And then we have Queen Essa the 11th, deposed aristocrat. 14 decks. Five hit protection. I wonder why they don't give them the other stats. Is it all presumed to be tens if they don't list them? That's interesting. Driven to preserve her bloodline and eat delicious creatures. Oh, uh, eat delicious creatures. All right. All right. All right. I can I can go with that. They have a royal guard detachment. Ten hit protection. Horses, modern armor, and axes. D8. I'm not sure what modern armor is, but okay. Footman detachment. That has seven hit points. Well, it has halberds. A reptile cult that gives her ten gold of income. And a hidden vineyard that gives her a D6 of income. And then we have some ships and structures. Cannons through different ships. Factories, forts, and then ships. Galleons through ironclads. Bam. And there's a little taste. We'll do, uh, we'll do refereeing tomorrow, I presume. But that was at least part one, let's call it, of our look at Into the Odds. So far, so good. I mean, there's always, you know, there's always things I'm going, like, ah, maybe I'd like it a little bit better like this or like that. But ultimately, overall, I think it's a really... Good set of rules. Seems to uh, be simple, but not not too simple. I think there's still a lot that can be done. I have never played, and this is, again, if I could do one-shots and do them, I would love to try this without rolling damage, or without rolling attacks and just rolling damage. I might need to play around and see if I can math out a little bit how I think it would go. I also want to look and see what monsters are like and kind of how, many, uh, how much hit protection, how much strength are they going to have, because that's really going to determine... A lot about how these combats go but certainly a different and interesting way to do it i know a lot of people like it i think from the player standpoint it could be fun because you know when you just swing and miss in combat it yeah it's not the most fun thing to do in a round and if you can have those where you may not be doing much but you feel like you're doing something i think that's always nice uh you know sometimes i do feel like hey you just sometimes you got to fail and, and just be good with it <laughs> but i think it is nice when you could feel like you're doing something in your six seconds or whatever of combat the stuff with uh, detachments and and uh, coming up with businesses and things like that are really good. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see more about how are these are supposed to operate in the game. You know, they, they talked about how you can have threats and things like that. Are they supposed to be just managed abstractly or are they supposed to become plot hooks? Hopefully the hopefully this stuff, the refereeing, will get into that. But so far, so good. Like it a lot. Of course, it's beautifully laid out. Johan Noor had it working at Mork Bor Mork 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 uh, amongst other things they've worked on. Uh, the Free League Press stuff looks pretty. I don't have a physical book to show off, but I'm sure, I mean, all the Free League physical stuff that I have so far has been impeccably made, as far as I can tell. So I'm sure this is similar. You can finally download it on drive through The link's in the show notes. Again, I'll be back, and we will continue on with the refereeing side. Uh, Perkins says, it gives loose structure, allowing you and your players to flesh out your game. Seems good for a one-shot. Yep. I think definitely this, I, I think a lot of times with these game systems, right, I want to say, well, it's great for a one-shot, but how would it be for a campaign? This one, at least, they're giving you the tools for campaign play. So even though they are kind of very sort of simple and abstract, they do give you a lot of stuff. I'd love to see kind of the refereeing tools, how they how they imagine or, or what tools they give you to kind of work with that. I, that's one of the things where I'd love to see an example of play. The one we read was basically a dungeon experience. That's great. But since we have these other tools of kind of your domain or outside the dungeon, um, what you're doing i'd love to see maybe they will have it maybe they won't what kind of what that's supposed to look like but we'll take a look deeper in the book 
Uh, if you're in here and you enjoy this, you can give a thumbs up on your way out. That would be awesome. If you are not subscribed and you found yourself in here and you say, boy, I love this stuff. Well, I would appreciate your subscription. If you'd love to hit the button, that would be awesome as well. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day, night, or whenever you end up watching or listening to this. Game on, everybody. And I will uh, talk to you later. Bye now.